Welcome. Yes, you read that correctly. We are going to be talking about the alleged drug trafficker who was sentenced to law school to finish law school instead of going to prison. Not only are we going to talk about that, we're going to talk about her attorney and we're going to talk a little bit about this concept of the girlfriend problem. Yeah. Welcome to the video. I want to go ahead and jump right into this so that you can see the actual complaint that we're talking about and see exactly what it was that she was charged with. So we have here U.S. District Court for the Southern District of Texas criminal complaint here. We have the person's name. We don't really care about that. But what we want to see is this was this is the date here, May 25th, 2018, possession with the intent to distribute in excess of 28.5 kilograms of cocaine, a Schedule II controlled substance, conspiracy to possess with the intent to distribute in excess of five kilograms of cocaine, a Schedule II controlled substance. Now, this is not some sort of light offense here. We're talking about intent to distribute. We're talking about drug trafficking. Okay, but I want to make sure that you have a chance to actually see the facts of this case, because that's really what it boils down to. You go, well, maybe the person didn't really have a whole lot going on here with this. And maybe, you know, that's why the person wound up in law school. I want us to look at the actual details that is in this C attachment a continued on attached sheet. And I'm going to go through this. Okay. In April 2008, agents with the DEA and the Texas Department of Public Safety, DPS, initiated an investigation into a drug trafficking organization here and after referred to as the DTO, operating in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas, Guadalajara, Mexico, Merida, Mexico, and other cities located in the northern part of the United States. Said investigation has revealed that members of the DTO, including Chelsea Medill, and this is the defendant, have operated and traveled through the Southern District of Texas in furtherance of their drug trafficking activities. Based on the investigation, eight agents have determined that Medill used companies to coordinate the transportation of cocaine loads concealed in cover loads from the Southern District of Texas to other destinations in the United States. Okay, so they're laying this out. Now, let's get into some of the details. On or about May 25th, 2018, agents conducted surveillance at a warehouse located at 1305 East Pecan Boulevard, warehouse units M and N, McAllen, Texas. During surveillance, agents observed a red Nissan sedan with Missouri registration registered to Hertz Car Rental in McAllen, Texas. Agents contacted a source of information and learned that the red Nissan was currently rented to Medill. Agents later observed Medill exit the aforementioned warehouse and meet with the driver of a tractor trailer that had arrived at said location. Agents observed Medill direct the driver to the tractor trailer to back up to the loading dock of Warehouse M. After the tractor trailer parked at the loading dock and while said trailer was loaded with a cover load, Medill stayed with the driver just outside the tractor trailer's driver's side door. Agents followed the tractor trailer after it departed the warehouse. Now, let me stop there because I'm sure some of you are saying, well, at this point, we've heard nothing really that makes it sound like she's doing anything other than she has this logistics company. These warehouses are being used. This is her car. Someone comes up with a tractor trailer. She's directing them as to go. And if these are her warehouses and, and this is what she does, then that's what you would expect her to be doing. So, so far, there's nothing out of the ordinary here, but they are laying the groundwork for some more information. Let me dive a little bit deeper into this. During a traffic stop, the driver of the tractor trailer consented to a search of the tractor trailer with the assistance of a DPS K-9 and a U.S. Customs and Border Protection X-ray scanning device, agents discovered 22 
vacuum sealed bundles of cocaine weighing, weighing approximately 28 and a half, 28.5 kilograms. After a post arrest interview, the driver was released. Let's go further down to the subsequent investigation here. Subsequent investigation and telephone toll records revealed that Medill utilized a cellular telephone to communicate with other members of the DTO while she was in the McAllen, Texas area. Well, here we go. Now we're actually connecting her to the larger drug operation. Agents also learned from another source of information that Medill had obtained the aforementioned warehouse in March 2018 to use for her company, Munsters Inc. Logistics. You can usually look that up on the Secretary of State's office too to see you know, when she got the company, but apparently these other people let her know that the warehouse was for the company. Subsequent investigation also revealed that Medill had obtained the cover load used to conceal the cocaine as evidenced by several bills of lading bearing Medill's company Munsters Inc. Logistics as the shipper. She is now the shipper. Her company is the shipper. And an additional company owned by Medill, Titanium Wholesale and Retail, as the received in Lombard, Illinois. On the day the seizure occurred, telephone toll analysis revealed that Medill was in contact with a Mexican telephone number utilized by the leader of the DTO who agents have identified during the investigation. So now let's backtrack. Now they have seized this truck. This person has been arrested. They have now attached her to being the person who has the bill of lading for this shipment, for this cover load. And they have telephone records showing that she was contacting this person who sounds like this person was the lead, was one of the lead people in this drug trafficking organization. So it sounds like she has connections way up to the top, right? You tell me, but that's what I'm reading. That's what it sounds like here. All right. Like it says there, on the day the seizure occurred, telephone toll analysis revealed that Medill was in contact with a Mexican telephone number utilized by the leader of the DTO, who agents have identified during the investigation. Yes, that is what it says. Let's scroll down here. Telephone toll analysis also revealed that Medill had contracted GPS tracking services through Brickhouse Security, a New York-based company that provides GPS tracking devices and services to customers. An administrative subpoena issued by agents to Brickhouse Security showed that Medill had purchased multiple GPS devices that were used to track the cover load that was found to contain the cocaine seized on May 25th, 2018, as well as other cover loads that are believed to have been utilized to transport narcotics and bulk U.S. currency. Okay, so wait a second. She was tracking these shipments. So she's got the warehouses. She's got the bills of lading. She now has GPS. She is tracking. She has telephone records connecting her to this leader of the organization. It's now not just drugs. It's also currency, they're saying here. So they have really laid out her participation in this. Following the seizure on or about May 31st, 2018, Medill traveled to Merida, Yucatan, Mexico. DEA agents conducted surveillance on Medill upon arrival in Merida and observed Medill meet with the leader of the DTO who is based in Mexico. She met with the leader. On June 3rd, 2018, DEA agents conducted additional surveillance and observed Medill board a flight to Merida, Mexico and travel to Atlanta, Georgia. Mexican federal authorities conducted an exit interview of Medill and learned that Medill had stayed with an unidentified friend at an unidentified location. Upon entry into the U.S. via an international airport in Atlanta, Georgia, CP, CBP in, inspectors verified that Medill was in possession of the phone she had used to communicate with other members of the DTO. So she kept that phone. I guess somewhere along the line, they didn't have a conversation about burners. On or about August 8th, 2018, agents obtained a consent to search the aforementioned warehouse from the owner who had been previously notified of Medill's intent to vacate the property and terminate the lease between herself and the owner. 
during the search, agents discovered multiple bills of lading for Munster Inc. Logistics and Titanium Wholesale and Retail, indicating the transportation of cover loads from the aforementioned warehouse to another warehouse in Lombard, Illinois. Both the aforementioned warehouse as well as the other um, warehouse were listed on all the bills of lading. Additionally, agents discovered a vacuum sealer commonly used to vacuum pack narcotics as well as discarded plastic wrappings consistent with the type and shape of wrappings used to conceal the narcotics seized on May 25th, 2018. So they have just continued to connect her to this drug trafficking operation. They now have another warehouse. They've been able to go in because she's notified the landlord that she's going to be vacating. They now find these other receipts and they find these wrappings. She just gets further and further connected. Even after the trips to Mexico, she gets further and further connected. All right, let's switch back over here so you can see where we are. Then it says, subsequent to the aforementioned cocaine seizure, a cooperating defendant advised the agents, oh, somebody told them, that Medill works for the aforementioned DTO as a drug trafficker. Somebody dropped all the beans, everything on her. The cooperating defendant told agents that the DTO's drugs originated in McAllen, Texas. Said cooperating defendant admitted that he, she had worked for Medill as a money courier and purchaser of cocaine and identified other members of the DTO working with Medill as well. So now someone has stepped up and shared all of this information about her. So where before they only had, oh, you know, okay, we've got her cell phone, we've got her car, she's the one who went to the warehouses, we've got these receipts, but now they have an actual person who is saying, hey, you know what? Um, yeah, I actually worked for her and I was a money courier and I purchased cocaine from her. Yeah. So that person can say a whole lot. All right. That's the end of the complaint. I want to pop over now to this plea agreement. And then we're going to look at this final judgment here. But let's let's get to the plea agreement first. Notice of plea agreement. So same case here. All right, now comes the U.S. of A, here and after referred to as the government, by and through its U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Texas and its assistant U.S. attorney assigned to this matter would respectfully show the court that the government and defendant have entered into the following plea agreement. Defendant agrees to plead guilty to one count of the indictment. indictment. The government will recommend that the offense level decrease by two levels if the defendant clearly demonstrates acceptance of responsibility and that the remaining count of the indictment be dismissed at the time of sentencing. And then there are some um, stipulations here um, that says that goes over whether or not if the person's a citizen or a naturalized citizen, what happens after that. And then you have the signatures of the parties and this was on the 19th. Now, let me go back and talk about uh, just one thing that sort of pops up sometimes because sometimes people think, you know, okay, so she's already had two levels taken off. She's only pleading to one count. What's going on here? In my review of the records, it looks like, and I'll go back and take a look here. In the initial, um, in the initial bout, it, it looks like her attorney is a public defender. Looks like uh, she was was having some good representation there but we're going to go on and look at this final look at this final <laughs> judgment this order that was signed by the judge here that has this information in it that we really want to see this is judgment in a criminal case united states district southern district of texas again holding session in mcallen Pleaded guilty. The defendant pleaded guilty to count one on August 2nd, 2019. Nature of the offense, conspiracy to possess, 
with intent to distribute 27.08 kilograms of a mixture or substance containing a detectable amount of cocaine. Here was uh, the offense count here. Count two is dismissed on the motion of the United States. Then on the second page, we have imprisonment. The defendant is hereby committed to the custody, custody of the Federal Bureau of Prisons to be imprisoned for a total term of five days. Time served. She's already served that five days. That's it. That's it for imprisonment. That is it. There's nothing else listed there. Then we have on page three, supervised release. Upon release from imprisonment, you will be on supervised release for a term of three years. It, and here are the mandatory conditions here. And then this one, we actually have X off. Of course, you know, these other ones apply. You must not commit another federal, state, or local crime, et cetera. And then this one says you must cooperate in the collection of DNA as directed by the probation officer. Then we have the standard conditions of supervision. So all of these down here apply, all of these that you see. But then it says here, see special conditions of supervision here. And let's scroll down and see what it says. It says you must continue to participate and complete an educational program designed to receive a doctor of jurisprudence degree. That's a law degree. Now, what is not clear here is whether or not she was already enrolled. What it says is that you must continue to participate and complete. So it sounds like she was maybe already enrolled. And let me tell you where this case originally comes from with me so that um, you can have a little bit of understanding for a second. So this originally came to me from an ABA journal article. This is the American Bar Association. And this came out earlier this month. Actually, I got it yesterday. Came out earlier this month. And what they said in their article was that they had found someone with that name listed at a Florida law school. And they think that this may be her. Now, one of the things that's a concern is that when you finish law school, they make you, um, you know, go through rigorous examination. And I don't mean the testing part. I mean the character part. And they ask whether or not you have any convictions and what those convictions were and when those convictions were and what the status is of any criminal complaints against you or civil complaints. They ask about all of that stuff and they or looking at your fitness to serve as an attorney. You guys, I remember I went through the same thing. She may finish with a law degree. She may or may not be able to sit for the bar. She may or may not be able to get a law license. It just depends. She might not be able to get it now. She might be able to get it in the future. But how often do we see sentencing like this for someone who participated at this level in a drug trafficking organization. I'm not putting down that they gave her this. What I'm saying is, can this be offered to more people? Are judges in other states willing to say, okay, was this primarily about economics? Because if so, let's put you on the right path so that you can fulfill your economic future and all of the wealth that you'd like to build for yourself and your family. Her case, I find to be a little interesting because drug trafficking is not like some other crimes because you're providing narcotics to people who maybe are addicted and in some cases may harm themselves or others. It, it, it just has a different level to it so it is interesting to me that the judge was willing to basically say, okay, yes, you've done your five days. Yes, we're going to tell you to just finish law school. How often do we see that happen? Well, maybe there's a reason why. Maybe it has something to do with the girlfriend problem. Some of you may remember a number of years back, and I have actually seen this where you have, and typically they say girlfriend problem because in the past, that's the situation that has occurred. It has been a woman who is a partner, a spouse, 
someone in a relationship with a man. This is typically the setup. This is not something I'm making up. And the other party is the one who's truly doing all of the illegal activity or most of it. And the women sort of get caught up in it. Now, mind you, they are definitely making a choice to participate. Let's just let's just step over to to this Rolling Stone article, because if you get a chance, I want you to take a look at it. It does a, a, a decent job of sharing with you what happened with one person and said, this is how this can happen sometimes when women get involved with people who are not making the right decisions and they start making the right, the wrong decisions also for whatever reason. But this article, I think, was um, sort of sums it up pretty well, I think. This is the Rolling Stone article that came out quite a few years ago, mandatory minimum sentencing might have a girlfriend problem. There are a few things that I want to highlight in this article, but definitely go over to Rolling Stone and check it out yourself so that you can understand exactly what I'm talking about here. <clears throat> so it says Congress forced federal judges to impose harsh sentences as a way to deter crime, but the result is often long prison sentences for women tangentially connected to offenders. Let me stop there. Do you think the person who I just outlined and the case that I just outlined was a person who was tangentially connected or do you think she had a lead role there? I, you know, I, I'm going to let you make that decision on your own. And so I've already read, looked at this one time, so it may not, it's probably not going to let me open it back up, but it talks about um, a person who had been involved with someone. She was sentenced in, um, in 2008 and she had once been the girlfriend of this person who was a drug dealer who was shot and killed. Since that time though, she had totally rechanged everything about her life. I think it even said she had become a teacher or something like that. You can check out the article yourself, but she had totally turned her life around. Here's the thing. Then you get to the point where you now have kids, you have family that you're taking care of, and you've moved on to become a productive member of society. You're making better choices. Is now really the time that we want to say, oh, but you need to go back and serve your time. And I hear a lot of people say, if you do the crime, do the time. The question is, what is the right time? What does that look like? How much time is appropriate? Has the person already started making up what they did to society? The people who get hurt the most are usually the families, especially the children. Are we so interested in punishing someone else that we give so little value to the rest of the family it's just a question i'm putting out there so that's how some of this girlfriend problem is being talked about and being analyzed one how involved was the girlfriend really and two to what extent has the person changed moved on started making better decisions and three what is the impact on the family, especially if there are children. And then, you know, we also go back to that whole, what is the right time for the crime? Yes, we've created mandatory minutes, mandatory minimums, sentencing guidelines, ways to level up and level down or whatever it is we want to call it. But that really came about from some people sitting in a room, some rooms, and saying, here's what we think this ought to be. Just as they have sat in those rooms and said, here's what we think that ought to be, they can also sit in those rooms now and say, maybe we need to tweak that, go back, take a look at that. Maybe we got some of these wrong. Maybe we need to allow more flexibility here. There is always room to come back and take a look at this and get things back on a track that makes a little bit more sense just putting it out there we have the girlfriend issue i don't know that she <laughs> was 
experiencing the girlfriend problem here. I'm just sharing with you what her relationship was, what she did and what the outcome was. Is there a way that more people can be given outcomes like that? Here's what kind of sentence we think you should serve. You are sentenced to law school. You are sentenced to having to take law school exams, having to read 40 cases a night, having to write essays, having to sit and listen to professors go on and on about things you may not even understand, taking exams, studying for the bar. I don't know, but that is what her sentence was. Maybe more people should have a sentence similar to that. But there you go. Let me know what you think. If you think the judge made the right decision here, if you think there was something else going on, if you think, yes, it is time to go back and take a look at doing this a different kind of way. Go ahead and give the video a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and peace.